<laughs> this is Money Line Mania. With Chaz and the crew. Chazzy Moto, what's going on, buddy? I was nervous because I was running late. Last week I ended the show with a loser. So now I th- I'm thinking to myself, I gave him a loser. Uh, I'm running late. This is really looking like I could get one of those emails where your services are no longer required. So I'm very glad that I made it to our Moneyline Mania section. But it's a weird time of year for a lot of people, guys. But for Wes and I, it's like the beginning. It's not Hanukkah. It's not Christmas. But it's better than the 4th of July, I think. You know, even though, Wes, don't they have a big holiday games this summer in Canada? It depends on what day of the week it falls. But the reliable schedule for Canadian football is is Thursday night, Friday night, and then usually two on Saturday. Every now and then you'll get one on Sunday and Canadian Thanksgiving, big holiday that usually falls on a Monday. So anyway, but I got to tell you another quick story that I'm going to let Wes talk because this was pretty funny. I worked my butt off to get all my bets in Friday for the hockey game. That's tonight. (laughs) <laughs> Don't get me wrong, baby. I'm overworked at this point in my career, but the bottom line, it was on my list of things to do. I didn't put what day. I just said handicap the hockey game. I knew there was going to be a hockey game. But it was pretty cool to have the whole day ahead, right? Already handicapped. So, Wes, what do you got? I'm looking at the Tampa Bay Lightning and the, and the Colorado Avalanche, and I'm not going to try and pick a winner because I don't think that there's value laying one and a half points to find yourself at plus money. Colorado is coming off just a dominant performance. And, and I think that they're the better team. I think that they're young. I think that they're hot. I, I think that Nathan McKinnon is to this league realistically what Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen can be. He's on the verge of a cup. So I, I don't want to compare the teams. But this is what I dug into. You go all the way back to April. And you look at Tampa coming off of a loss. You got to take out their multiple losses in a row. They lost two in a row to the Rangers. And then they had an ugly stretch of multiple losses early in April. But if you take those multiples off, coming off of a loss, they score three goals or more. They scored eight goals in one case. They scored seven goals in one case. So coming off of a loss, since that ugly streak in April, they're eight no. If we're looking at going over the team total for this particular game, it's two and a half team total for Tampa. They are going to score more than two and a half goals. Whether or not they win is irrelevant to me. Tampa can score goals at will. They've proven that throughout the playoffs. They just took down the hottest goalie in the tournament. And at the same time, I think everybody that knows hockey is on the same page that we're up for mediocre for that Colorado goalie. So my play is Tampa over two and a half goals total for the game. And I think this one could be cashing for us mid-second period. I actually did cash on that last game because, yeah, I'm looking at the data, and when you separate out just their away games, there's nothing but twos or greater. And it was two and a half. Well, it was three to one, right? You're not thinking it looks like they're going to score. And then bada boom, bada bing, as they say when you're Italian, uh, it was three to three. And they're now coming off a loss, an overtime loss, where they came back and scored two real quick. So them coming off a loss as well coached as they are, this is not going to be a sweep of a series. So there's going to come a game. I have some inside information that was relayed to me by one of my handicapper guys. It was on the, the previous game. It was to bet the under six. And it didn't look like it was even close to being close. And it ended up right about there. So he wasn't far from it. So I went and I took that information and I moved it over to tonight. I, I'm, I'm sticking with the under tonight. I think, like you said, if Tampa Bay is going to keep this game close, the way they're going to do it is three to two, something where, like that's what I'm looking at. Now, Wes, I have a question for you. You mentioned the, the Tampa bounce back potential. We've seen outside of maybe the first five games against the Leafs this postseason, Tampa's been doing it more in bunches. They won the last two against Toronto, then they swept the Panthers that lost two against the Rangers, then four in a row after that. They do, and that Rangers series, it almost looked like the Rangers had all kinds of momentum going on, and, and it just looked like Tampa needed to find their legs in that series because the Rangers came out and took it to them in those first two. But then something happened, and I think that that something happened was Steven Stamkos, that is just a star player, ultimate leader in hockey, showing up big and dragging his team along with it. But now they got point back. That's a big player returning. I agree with you that something happened late in the series, and they do win in bunches. And it can be demoralizing. You got the best goalie in the world on that team coming off of a performance where he just allowed four goals. That doesn't happen often either. Yeah, and that was the thing in game one with the Rangers, too. He allowed six goals, and a lot of them were bad goals, too. Uncharacteristic for him. I remember you texted me while I was 
on vacation, Wes. You texted the group, you were saying, oh, these Rangers, they came out just as you thought they would, up to nothing, and then just couldn't find anything offensively. The Rangers were exciting to watch. They were that upstart team, and if they would have taken down Tampa, it wouldn't have bothered me. I'm not a Tampa fan. It's good for the sport to see a three-peat, but it's also good for the sport to see a large market like New York to get a team like the Rangers in there, get MSG popping again. God knows the Knicks aren't going to do it for you in that city. As a fan of both teams, yeah, I would say more likely for the Rangers. Well, growing up back there, I've got a big time thread on social media from East Coast guys, and they were rocking. New York Rangers fans were rocking, and it was fun. And again, because we were talking to 103.9 West the whole summer, we saw it three or four weeks before the season was even over. We were watching the Rangers play better, and the Islanders sliding backwards. And the Rangers really very well-balanced team. They have great players. They have some all-stars. I don't think that they have a sure shot Hall of Famer on that roster like some of these other teams in the playoffs. And they were just getting it from depth and balance. They were just fun to watch. All right, so before we go any further, we have to give the guy that called the future NBA championship plus 900 winner. We got to give him a shout out. Clapping. <laughs> I don't do a lot of futures. I had one recently. What was that I had in, in the NBA? Made money on a team that lost. Villanova. When your team wins, you don't have to worry about making money on it. You made money on it. So congratulations, Wes. No doubt Thank you it. very much. Listeners can't see it, but I'm doing a step shim. <laughs> And, and, and I the know other I know. aspect of it is Canadian football. So you're on the radio a lot. And you do your show a lot, Speedy. How much CFL are you talking? The only CFL we've really been talking is just some of the guests we've had on that used to be CFL players or they were ex-NFL players. Uh, we had one a couple weeks ago, Stefan Logan, that was a wide receiver, a kick returner, played for the Steelers and the Lions in the NFL, played for three different CFL teams as well. And he was mentioning the first time we had him on the show, when we had him on two years ago, he was mentioning a lot of things you've been mentioning, Wes, a lot of the rule changes that have happened being different than the NFL. Now he's definitely been well pulsed on both games now. Very knowledgeable guy. Fun guy to have on the show. Some of the rules, it's a different game. It is football. I believe that the last three minutes of a CFL game, if the game is within seven points, the last three minutes of a CFL game, the only thing that can compare to it is playoff NHL overtime. They don't have a two-minute warning. They have a three-minute warning. Correct. So that's a timeout. Everybody stops. And when you're getting close to that end zone, that end zone is so big. And the field goals are so close. And you don't see this in too many football games. If Oklahoma State is playing Texas A&M, you can get three scores in the last three minutes. But in a <laughs> CFL game, it's totally possible. There's no value to taking the knee because it's two and out. So you take two knees and you're going to cost yourself 10 yards by doing it and ruin your field position for the punt. It almost worked in the Louisiana Bowl with the water boy. Almost. <laughs> Don't mess with Bobby Boucher. Last week, you weren't here. Hector went two and one. But you know what? I tell these guys, that's the other aspect about sports betting, whether it's Paolo or Hector. It's not money line or points. It's win, lose, or draw. There's three odds. There's three things you could bet. Every soccer game, so almost every play Hector gives us is plus money. It's not because it's an underdog. It's the favorite at plus money. Sometimes the favorite is the draw if it's a low-scoring game that they're assuming. But it's funny because he goes two and one most weeks, Wes, and we're plus three units. <laughs> How does wow. that happen? You know? That's great, though. Wes, you've, you've done the same thing with CFL, but remember, it was three years ago. We talked about it, and then we lost it. Then we got it back, but we got the stepchild version of CFL. This year, we've got what you talked about. I'm just loving it. It really, and especially I'm working a lot, so it is so cool that the games are on ESPN or ESPN Plus because you can watch them, but it is. If you've never watched CFL, you've got to watch it as it's football. Don't worry about what the hell the guys are doing. Don't worry about any of that stuff. You'll figure that stuff out. You're going to be going to the bridge, right, Wes? And they come back and your team has a point. And you have no idea why your team has a point. So then you go to the bathroom and you come back and you're looking at a football game where the score is one to one. You just got to let that stuff go. You got to just relax and you look at the hits, you look at the passes, you look at the catches. There's some good football players, Wes, on those fields. There is. And the flow of the game, it's exciting. Like you said, it's easy to find the games. But, you know, it is funny. When you look at the scoreboard, like I think we were exchanging text messages last night and it, the score is six to one. It's like, how does that happen? But there is a strategy behind those singles and the length of the field. If they're at the 50 yard line in the NFL, kicking a field goal, that what a 67 yarder, 68 yarder. If you're at the 50 yard line in the CFL, that's a 50 yard field goal and they're making it. 
But here's the thing. This is a sports betting story. This is classic sports betting. I have my second half data. Now, they call me second half chats for a reason. I got like 14 years of second half data. But it's my only loser, and it was that team. Remember last year they were perfect? And I lost on a missed extra point. I could not oh. believe it. That's football. You don't lose on a missed extra point in any other sport. If you don't think Canadian football is football, then you've never lost on a missed extra point. So that was basically the TFL version of the 2003 Saints that ruined a perfectly good lateral miracle by a missed extra point that would have tied the game. <laughs> Oh, yeah, exactly. And it really is. It's so disheartening when you're watching because you can tell most missed extra points aren't even close. Or they're loud because you hear the noise. (laughs) Yeah. So let's talk about tonight's game. Tonight's game, it's Saskatchewan and Edmonton. I'm going to say some things that aren't very nice. I'm doing it in the spirit of sports investing. Edmonton is not very good. Edmonton is my pick to be dead last in the entire league this year. They they tried to make some moves mid-season last year. And Nick Arbuckle, they tried to make a move at quarterback, but I think they made the wrong move. But in any case, they traded away Ellingson. He, he now plays at Winnipeg, and he's number one, number two receiver quality. They really cost themselves the ability to score points. Edmonton is coming off of a performance to BC where they lost 59 to 15. 59 points were hung on them. And the quarterback that did it is Nathan Rourke. Comes from the University of Ohio. Nathan Rourke has got a bright future in the CFL. He's mobile. He can throw the ball. God, it was fun to watch him Tuesday night in action. Um, Back action, baby. Exactly. He's in a good place. He's taken over from Michael Riley. BC is going to do well. However, Hanging 59, Nathan Rourke and BC is not 59 points on anybody good enough. So now let's move to this week and let's look at Edmonton. All the good things about BC, I don't think that their defense is hold somebody to 15 points good. Now we're going to get Saskatchewan coming to town. You're going to get Cody Fajardo, who's running the ball, throwing the ball, and he's coming off of kind of a mediocre performance, one touchdown. If you're talking about the best quarterback in the CFL, Cody Fajardo is either 1 or 1A, and I don't think that there's any further discussion about it. He's going to be licking his chops coming into this game. Sask is coming off of a tremendous defensive performance against Hamilton. They only allowed the Ticats 13 points, and at the same time, they hung 30. And Hamilton's odd, because early in the season, usually, it takes some time for their defense to build up. But when you hang 30 on Hamilton, they're one of the top defenses from a year ago. Hanging 30 on Hamilton, I would only think the translation to Edmonton is you're going to hang at least that and then some. So I am laying the seven and a half points. That is not a number I like to lay. Anything over six and a half, you know, that, that has to be a real lopsided matchup for me in any sport. But I think Saskatchewan is going to go into Edmonton and they're going to cover the seven and a half for sure. I think it's going to be ugly. We are probably going to find a tremendous amount of caches just simply betting against Edmonton and laying the points this season. There's nine teams is all there is. There's two of them last year that stunk so bad that betting against them was easy. There were two that were good. We bet them, and then we kind of left the guys in the middle alone, and it was just a wonderful run, but it was only a handful. Look, 12 games? What did they play last year? Remember? Last year was a reduced season. Winnipeg was 11-3, and three, so it was 14 games. Yeah, and then only a couple rounds of the play. Playoffs. All yeah. right, so so it's so funny. Again, I was happy that you had me on. I know I gave you a loser last week. I do apologize for that. But I was running late, so I didn't have time to do all the numbers. You know, I like throwing numbers at you. And their last 17, they're, you know, 14 and 3, they've scored whatever. But listen to these notes. This is what I've got on Edmonton. In the first half, I simply wrote, don't score. For the game, allow a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a fancy sports betting term. But if you know a team that allows a lot, trust me, it's a valuable sports betting term. In the first half, I've got Saskatchewan. And remember two years ago when we first started this, Wes, I couldn't say it? I called them the Rough Riders because I couldn't say Saskatchewan. They don't allow points in the first half. They don't score a lot, though. So the bottom line is they're the better team. The line went from eight to seven and a half. I got it at eight. You said seven and a half. So it's moved a little bit. They should win this game. I don't know about the total. Any opinions on the total, Wes? The odds are not the greatest, but the total has Sask at 27 and a half. I like the over there because I think Sask is going to hang a 30 burger, but the odds on it are minus 145. So not the best odds. I think that we're safe, especially the way that that defense played last week. I mean, they just played nasty and took Yeah, the well, ball I'll tell away. you right now, when you look at this easy sports data, 
There's a lot of numbers, what the other team scored column for the Edmonton team that are over that number you just mentioned. Yeah. They're higher than that number. They've given up that number a lot. If we're looking at team totals, you know, Edmonton is 20 and a half. They scored 15 on BC. One would think they're going to really struggle to do that against a SAS team that completely shut down Hamilton. Now, now that Hamilton game, they lost their quarterback. They lost their starting quarterback. And the guy that they went to, for all intents and purposes, is the number three just because they're in a transition. Jeremiah Mazzola. It was traded and he was the starter last year. So number two became one, number three became two. 